All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Today we have uh, a good friend uh, of mine, uh, Erka Lepinen, giving a talk about his uh, his one of the, his favorite topics recently, associative spectra of graph algebra. We know each other for quite a while, so met on many conferences in Europe mostly. So he, um, he started uh, in Finland and then recently was working in Portugal. And so we're very glad to have, to have him, um, even though he, most of his work was in universal algebra, but a lot of what he's doing is actually in um, combinatorics as well. So we thought like it would be nice cross section uh, between two areas. So welcome. Thank you, Kira, for this uh, nice introduction and uh, for the opportunity to present uh, some of my work. Uh, so this uh, is joint work with uh, Tomasz Waldhauser from the University of Seged. And uh, here are my funding acknowledgements that you can quickly read here. So the topic of my talk is uh, associative spectra of graph algebras. So perhaps I should start by explaining what the words in the title mean. So first of all, associativity, that's a familiar notion. Uh, a binary operation is called associative if it satisfies this identity called the associative law. And uh, a binary operation may or may not be associative. Um, there have been many proposals uh, to have a finer uh, classification of operations, uh, uh, finer than just the associative or non-associative, or, or, or rather uh, proposals how to quantify the degree of uh, associativity of the binary operation or the corresponding groupoid. By a groupoid, I mean an algebra with a single binary operation. There are, of course, many ways to quantify associativity. Uh, one possible way would be to consider the distance of the operation from an associative operation. What does this mean? We could uh, change the values of the operation at some points so that we obtain uh, an associative operation. And the minimum number of changes needed would be the distance from an associative operation. Another possibility was, would be to consider the associative law. This involves uh, triples of uh, elements from the uh, domain of the operation. And we could uh, just count the number of uh, triples for which uh, this equality holds. Perhaps we would then need to somehow normalize uh, either the distance uh, from the associative operation or the number of triples satisfying the associative law, normalize it uh, with respect to the cardinality of uh, the, the domain on which this operation is defined so that we could in a meaningful way, compare operations defined on sets of different sizes. And there are perhaps uh, many different ways to uh, do this. Uh, however, we are not going to uh, talk about these uh, measures of uh, associativity, but uh, rather uh, perhaps a more algebraic uh, way of doing this. Maybe we could uh, look at uh, the associative law and we could consider the number of um, identities that are consequences of the associative law that would be satisfied by the operation. I will define this uh, in precise way um, in a moment, but I first need to introduce a few concepts. The first notion is that of a bracketing. Uh, a bracketing of n variables is a word uh, comprising the n variables x1, x2, and so on, up to xn. 
each variable occurs exactly one and they appear in this exact order in the increasing order of the indices and uh, in this word we can then insert uh, pairs of parentheses in such a way that we obtain a valid uh, groupoid word this can of course be done in different ways and um, yeah, so, so, so we denote by BN the set of all valid bracketings of N variables. And below here, I have listed the sets of uh, bracketings of N variables for some small numbers N. The, these sets, the, the, the number of uh, bracketings of N variables grows very fast. But these numbers are well known. They are the so-called uh, Catalan numbers. Then a bracketing identity is an identity T equals T prime, where T and T prime are bracketings of N variables for some natural number N. An example of a bracketing identity is the associative law. Now we can start to define the associative spectrum. Let A be a groupoid. First, uh, the fine associative spectrum of A is a family of equivalence relations, where for each natural number n, we define an equivalence relation sigma n of A on the set of bracketings of n variables that relates to bracketings s and t if and only if uh, a satisfies the identity s equals t. In other words, uh, uh, sigma n of a is the fragment of the equational theory of the groupoid a when restricted just to bracketing, ID, uh, bracketing identities. The associative spectrum of A is a sequence of natural numbers, Sn of A, where the nth member of the sequence is the number of equivalence classes of the equivalence relation sigma n of A. In other words, this number, Sn of A, counts the number of distinct term operations induced by the bracketings of n variables on A. These numbers can be as small as one. This happens when the operation is associative, then the uh, parentheses don't matter. All bracketings of n variables induce the same term operation. These numbers can be as high as the number of distinct bracketings of n variables, and these are the Catalan numbers. Considering the entire spectrum, which is a sequence of uh, uh, these numbers, on the one extreme, we have the constant one sequence, which would correspond to the associative operations. And on the other extreme, we have uh, the sequence of Catalan numbers. And we would call this uh, case an, an anti-associative operation. So for, for an anti-associative operation, distinct bracketings always induce distinct term operations. And then the associative spectrum could be somewhere between these two extremes. Intuitively, the faster this sequence uh, grows, the less associative the operation is considered. This notion uh, was introduced by Bela Czakaj and Tomasz Waldhauser in the year 2000. But uh, it has appeared uh, in the literature under different names 
by different authors. In the work by Charkai and Waldhauser and Diebser and Waldhauser, it's been called associative spectrum. It's also known as uh, the sub-associativity type of the groupoid or the number of star equivalence classes of parenthesizations of uh, the product x0, x1, up to xn. In these papers, uh, the associative spectra of various groupoids have been uh, determined. Uh, Waldhauser and his co-authors, they also had some nice theoretical results uh, concerning possible associative spectra. They showed, for instance, that there exist uh, uncountably many different uh, associative spectra, or that, um, for, for instance, there exist uh, groupoids uh, whose uh, spectrum is a polynomial of uh, an arbitrary given degree. All right. We are interested in associative spectra of graph algebras. So what is a graph algebra? These were introduced by Shellen in the 1970s as uh, to, to provide examples of uh, non-finitely based uh, finite algebras. So let G be a directed graph. We can define then the graph algebra of G denoted by A of G. Its uh, universe is the set of the vertices of G together with a new element called infinity. And it has two fundamental operations, the binary product and the nullary operation. The, the new element infinity is considered as a nullary operation. That is a constant operation. And the product is defined by this rule. x times y is equal to x if xy is an edge. And otherwise, the product is infinity. In particular, all products involving the infinity yield infinity. Here's a little example. We have a directed graph with four vertices. And this is its uh, graph algebra. We have the four vertices and the new element infinity. So let's see. We have, for instance, an edge from A to B. So the product A times B should be A. That's correct. For instance, we don't have an edge from C to B. So the product C times B should be infinity. That's right. Loops are allowed. For instance, here we have a loop on D. So D times D should be equal to D. And all products with infinity are equal to infinity. Good. So graph algebras uh, provide um, a nice way of uh, encoding graphs as algebras. And using this encoding, we can view any algebraic properties of the graph algebra of G as properties of the graph G itself. And in this way, it makes sense to speak of uh, commutative graphs or associative graphs and so on. So we are interested in the satisfaction of identities by graphs. At this point, I would, uh, if this talk was presential, I would uh, make a little quiz and I would offer some cookies for good answers. But uh, let me do this quiz virtually. So let's, uh, let's consider these uh, notions that we have now seen. So, so which graphs are idempotent? That is, uh, their graph algebras satisfy the identity x times x is equal to x. So x could be either the vertex of the graph, or it could be infinity 
if x is infinity, then on the left side, we have infinity times infinity on the right, which is equal to infinity. On the right side, we have infinity. So this is fine. But if x is a vertex, then we have that x times x, it is either equal to x or infinity. On the right side, we have x, which is a vertex. So on the left side, we should also get the vertex x as the product. So this means that uh, x, th there is an edge from x to x. That is, there is a loop on each vertex x. So a graph is idempotent if and only if every vertex has a loop. How about commutative graphs? Graphs that satisfy the identity x times y is equal to y times x. Again, if one of these uh, uh, variables x, y takes value infinity, then the product is infinity on both sides. So this case is fine. So let's consider the case when both x and y are vertices. In this case, the product is equal to the product x y is equal to x or infinity. The product y x is equal to either y or infinity. So if both uh, sides are equal to infinity, this would be fine. This corresponds to the case when there is no edge from x to y and there is no edge from y to x. The equality would hold also in the case when x and y are the same vertex. And this would mean that uh, there is a loop from uh, on x. So this means that a graph is commutative if and only if the only edges are loops. How about associativity? Which graphs satisfy the associative law? This is perhaps not so easy to see, and maybe some tools would be helpful to consider this question. And in order to provide the tool, I need to introduce one more notion. Namely, uh, we can associate uh, with any term in the language of groupoids, a directed graph in the following way. So let T be a term in the language of graph algebras. We say that uh, the term is trivial if it contains infinity. And now we consider only non-trivial terms, non terms that don't contain the constant symbol. That is, they are, after all, groupoid terms. OK, so for each such term t, we define a directed graph g of t. The vertices are the variables occurring in the term. And the edges are given by this recursive definition, which basically uh, says the following. For each product occurring in the term, we look at the two factors and the leftmost variables occurring in the two factors. And we will have an edge from the leftmost variable of the first factor to the leftmost variable of the second factor. For example, here is a term. Let's look at uh, the products occurring in this term. For instance, here we have x3 times x4. The leftmost variables of these two factors are x3 and x4. So we should have an edge from x3 to x4. It's right here. Similarly, we have a product x3 times x2. We should have an edge from x3 to x2. It's right here. Then we have the subterms x3, x4 and x3, x2. The leftmost variables are x3 and x3. So we should have an edge, oops, sorry, from x3 to x3. That's the loop here. 
and so on. We obtain this graph from this given term t. All right. And now comes the helpful tool. This, was, this is a theorem um, by Perschel and Wessel. So let S and T be non-trivial terms that have the same variables. And let G be a graph. Then the graph algebra of G satisfies the identity S equals T if and only if this condition holds. So the set of homomorphisms from the graph associated with the term S to the target graph G is the same as the set of homomorphisms from the graph associated with the term T into the target graph G. And for each such homomorphism, H, H maps the leftmost variables occurring in the two terms to the same element, to the same vertex. So this is a very nice theorem. Now considering whether a graph satisfies an identity uh, reduces to considering homomorphisms of some graphs into the given target graph. We are particularly interested in the special case where the leftmost variables in the two terms are the same, such as in the associative law. And in this special case, the leftmost variables of the two terms are automatically mapped to the same vertex. So this, this condition holds automatically. So it's just a matter of uh, whether the homomorphisms from the two graphs associated with the two terms into the target graph G are the same. OK, so now let's get back to the associative law. Here are the graphs associated with the two terms in the associative identity. And now let's try to figure out uh, what the associativity of the uh, graph means. So according to the theorem by Perschel and Wessel, the graph is associative if and only if uh, these two graphs have the same homomorphisms into the target graph. So let's first consider a homomorphism of the first graph. So this can be mapped homomorphically into a graph. Uh, if there is a path, a directed path of length two, so we can map this on a directed path of length two. That's a homomorphism of the first graph, but uh, according to the theorem of Perschel and Wessel, this must also be a homomorphism of the second graph into the target graph. In this graph, we have an edge from x1 to x3. So we should have an edge from the image of x1 to the image of x3, that is, we would have in our target graph also an edge from the initial vertex of the path to the final vertex. So this means that uh, the edge relation is actually transitive. The edge relation is transitive. Now let's consider a homomorphism of the second graph into the target graph. So we can map this graph homomorphically into a vertex and any two of its out neighbors. So that would be a homomorphism of the second graph into G. By Perschel and Wessel's theorem, this must be also a homomorphism of the first graph into our target graph. In this graph, we have an edge from x2 to x3. 
So we should have also an edge between the image of X2 and the image of X3. That is, there is an edge between the two out neighbors of uh, this vertex. From this, it immediately follows that uh, for every vertex, its out neighborhood must be a complete graph with loops. So here we have the condition. A graph G is associative if and only if the edge relation is transitive and the subgraph induced on the out neighborhood of any vertex is a complete graph with loops. The associative graphs uh, were uh, described by Pomsaard in the year 2000. He also gave uh, a third uh, equivalent condition for associativity. All right. So we are now interested in um, the associative spectra of graph algebras. So we are looking into whether um, a graph satisfies a bracketing identity. And now we can use as a tool for the analysis the theorem by Herschel and Wessel, which translates the problem into considering homomorphisms of some graphs into our target graph. So the first thing we should do is to determine what kind of graphs are associated with bracketings. And it turns out that uh, they are very nice and simple. The graph associated with any bracketing is a DFS tree. DFS stands for depth first search. A DFS tree is a tree a, a, a rooted directed tree with vertices x1, x2 up to xn, the, the variables in the bracketing of n variables. And uh, the vertices are arranged in such a way that uh, this tree can be traversed by the depth first search and the vertices are discovered in the increasing order of the indices. So if we start from the root in this example, we fi find x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, then we go back, continue here, x6, 7, x8, x9, and so on. The graph is drawn here in such a way that the depth first search goes kind of from the left to the right in this tree. This is in actually the, the graph associated with this bracketing of 20 variables. All right, so the problem of considering whether a graph satisfies a bracketing identity is translated to the problem of considering whether two DFS trees have the same sets of homomorphisms into the target graph. So when does a graph algebra of a graph G satisfy a bracketing identity T equals T prime, where T and T prime are distinct bracketings of in variables. So here are just some schematical uh, drawings of uh, the graphs or the DFS trees associated with uh, the terms T and T prime. Distinct bracketings yield distinct DFS trees. So if T and T prime are distinct, then there must exist the, the vertex V that has different parents in the two DFS trees. So say in, in the first graph, the parent of the, the vertex V is P. In the second one, it's Q. All right. 
So let us first consider the special case of uh, undirected graphs. When does an undirected graph satisfy a bracketing identity? Okay, assume we have an, an undirected graph. Oh, because we are now considering homomorphisms of the DFS trees corresponding to the two terms into our graph. It is sufficient to consider uh, the connected components of the graph because the homomorphic image of the, the connected graph is a connected graph. So let's consider first, uh, we, we assume that we have a graph satisfying the identity T equals T prime. We consider a connected component and let's first consider the case where the connected component has a loop at some vertex. Here is a vertex with a loop. Suppose the component has another vertex. So this vertex with a loop has a neighbor. What we can do now is we can map the red DFS tree homomorphically into this graph. We simply map all vertices into this vertex with a loop, but we make two exceptions. We map V and Q into this vertex. It's kind of easy to see that this must be a homomorphism of the red graph into this graph. We were assuming that, that the graph satisfies the identity, so the red graph must have the same homomorphisms into this graph as the green graph has. So this map is also a homomorphism of the green graph into this graph. In the green graph, we have an edge from Q to V. So we must have an edge from the image of Q to the image of V. So we must have a loop here. All right. Let's assume there is still another vertex. So, well, by what we have just observed, we must have loops at all vertices. And now let's consider again a homomorphism of the red graph into this graph. We could do as we did before. So we map all vertices into this vertex with the loop in the middle, and we make two exceptions. But now we map V and Q to these different vertices. So this is again a homomorphism of uh, the red graph into this graph. It must also be a homomorphism of the green graph into this graph. We have an edge from Q to V, so there must be an edge from the image of Q to the image of V, like this. So what does this mean? This simply means that uh, the edge relation must be transitive. The edge relation is also reflexive because we must have loops at all the vertices in this component. And the edge relation is symmetric because we are assuming that we are dealing with an undirected graph. In other words, uh, this connected component must be a complete graph with loops. Uh, conversely, a complete graph with loops clearly satisfies every bracketing identity because uh, every map from a DFS tree to a complete graph is a homomorphism. Okay, let's now consider the case where the connected component has no loop but it's a non-trivial component. So we have an edge in this component. We have the two vertices connected by an edge. Now let's consider a homomorphism of the red graph into this graph or, or a, a tree into this graph. How can we map a tree homomorphically to this edge? Well, there is basically one way so we can map the root into one of the vertices. Its children must be mapped to, to the other vertex. The children of the children must be mapped again to the first vertex. 
their children are mapped to the second vertex, and so on. In other words, uh, any homomorphism of a tree maps uh, each vertex of even depth to one of the vertices and each vertex of odd depth to the other vertex. And in order for the homomorphisms of these two graphs to be the same into this graph, it is necessary that uh, each vertex has the same depth modulo two in the two trees. Okay, so let's now consider um, the case when the component has more vertices. Suppose we have a path of length three. And let's now consider again homomorphisms of these two graphs. So we could map this red graph homomorphically into this graph. We could do as we did here. So we could map uh, the vertices of odd and even uh, depth alternating between the two vertices in the middle. We do it in such a way that uh, B gets mapped to this vertex. And then we make two exceptions again with uh, the vertices V and Q. So we map V here and Q here. It's easy to see that this is a, a homomorphism of the red graph into this graph. It must be a homomorphism of the green graph into this graph. We have an edge from Q to V, so we must have an edge from the image of Q to the image of V. So this means if we have a path of length three in our target graph, we must also have an edge from the initial vertex of the, of the path to the final vertex of the path. And I claim that from this, it follows that uh, a connected component without loops must be a complete bivertite graph. So first of all, suppose to the contrary, that uh, this component had a cycle of odd length. Then using this rule, we could uh, reduce or, or, or find a shortcut in this cycle. And we could just skip two of the vertices in this uh, cycle and we obtain a shorter cycle. If the, the initial cycle had length n, we would obtain a cycle of length n minus two. And in this way, we can find shorter and shorter cycles until we reach a cycle of length one. But this would be a contradiction. We are assuming that the connected component has no, no loops. So this doesn't happen. There are no cycles of odd length. So this means the component is uh, bivertite. Uh, in order to see that it's a complete bipartite graph. So we have the two parts of the uh, vertices. Let's take a vertex from the first part, another vertex from the second part. Since it's a connected graph, we must have a path from the first vertex to the second vertex. It is of odd length. Once again, using this, we can find a shortcut. If, if the, the, the path has, has length n, then we have a shortcut yielding a path of length, length n minus two. And we can repeat this and we obtain shorter and shorter paths connecting the two vertices until we reach the path of length one connecting the two vertices. Path of length one is an edge. So indeed, it's a complete bipartite graph. And conversely, if uh, the graph is a complete bipartite graph, then and uh, the the two uh, terms in the identity satisfy this condition that uh, that uh, each vertex has the same depth modulo two, then we can easily see that uh, this graph satisfies the identity. So this pretty much uh, describes the, the situation for the 
undirected graph, graphs. There are basically three different possibilities. So let G be an undirected graph. If every connected component of G is either trivial or a complete graph with loops, then G satisfies every bracketing identity. And in this case, the associative spectrum of G is the constant one sequence. That is, the graph is associative. The second possibility, every connected component of G is either trivial, a complete graph, or a complete bipartite graph. And at least one of the components is a complete bipartite graph. Then G satisfies the bracketing identity T equals T prime, if and only if uh, in the DFS3 corresponding to T and T prime, each vertex has the same depth modulo two. And in this case, we can show that uh, the associative spectrum is the sequence of powers of two. And in all other cases, the graph G satisfies no non-trivial bracketing identity. And in this case, the spectrum is the sequence of Catalan numbers. So this is a very nice result. Uh, but this is for the special case of uh, undirected graphs. The situation with uh, general directed graphs is considerably more difficult. And unfortunately, we haven't uh, succeeded yet in finding uh, a complete uh, characterization of the associative spectra of general directed graphs. We did, however, obtain a necessary and sufficient condition for an arbitrary directed graph to satisfy an arbitrary bracketing identity. I will get back to this in a moment. But uh, I, I will first explain uh, another nice result uh, that we obtained. Namely, we obtained um, an explicit description of the anti-associative graphs. In order to present this, I need to, to give a few notions. So we say that uh, two vertices, U and V, are strongly connected if there exist the directed paths both from U to V and from V to U. The relations of vertices being strongly connected is an equivalence, equivalence relation on the set of vertices. And its equivalence classes are called the strongly connected components. The one vertex graph with no loop is the trivial strongly connected graph. We say that a walk is pleasant if it only contains vertices from a trivial strongly connected components. And one more notion, an M whirl is a strong homomorphic pre-image of a directed M cycle. And a whirl is an M whirl for some M. Here is an example of, of a five whirl. So we have these five blocks of vertices. The blocks are these colored uh, uh, sets. Uh, and uh, the vertices are arranged in such a way that uh, for each block, there is a, a successor block so that uh, for every vertex in the first block, there is an edge to every vertex in the successor block. And in this way, we can go around the five blocks. Uh, please note uh, uh, two special cases of uh, M worlds. If M, M is equal to one, a one world means that uh, we have just one block of uh, vertices and there is an edge from every vertex to every vertex. In other words, the one whirl is just the complete graph with loops. 
uh, a two world. We have two blocks. We have vertices from every vertex of the first block to every vertex of the second block. And we have an edge from every vertex of the second block to every vertex of the first block. But this means that the graph is a complete bivertite graph. So these two special cases, the one world and the two world, they were the kind of graphs that uh, played an important role in the description of the associative spectrum of uh, undirected graphs. Uh, but for M at least three, we then have uh, the, the, the M worlds are graphs where we, we don't have any symmetric edges. All right. So using these notions, we can now describe the anti-associative graphs. Or this is rather an, uh, a description of non-anti-associative graphs. A digraph G is not anti-associative if and only if the following conditions hold. Every non-trivial strongly connected component is a whirl. There is no path from a non-trivial strongly connected component to another. There is a finite upper bound on the length of the pleasant paths. And there is a finite upper bound on the numbers M such that the G contains an M whirl. So this describes the, the not anti-associative graphs. That is, they are the graphs that satisfy some bracketing identity, but we don't specify which one. I'm not even going to try to explain how this is proved. So let's now get to the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for an arbitrary graph to satisfy an arbitrary uh, bracketing identity. Uh, this condition is expressed in terms of uh, several numerical parameters related to, on the one hand, a pair of distinct DFS trees, and on the other hand, on the graph. And I'll just give you some examples of these uh, numerical parameters just to give you an idea what, what this is about. So here is a pair of DFS trees. The first parameter called HTT prime. This is simply the minimum of the heights of the two trees. In this example, it's the height of this tree, which is six. The second parameter, MTT prime, this is the largest number M such that uh, each vertex has the same depth in the two trees modulo M. In this example, this number is three. So I have colored the vertices uh, into blue, green, and red according to whether its depth is uh, 0, 1, or 2 modulo 3. And we can see that all vertices have the same color in both vertices, uh, both trees. The next parameter called LTT, this indicates uh, up to which depth the two trees are identical. In this example, the two trees are identical up to depth 2. Uh, the next two parameters are related to induced subgraphs. I'm considering only uh, induced subgraphs of a special form. So for um, each vertex, we take the vertex and all its descendants. And uh, for such induced subtrees, uh, the parameter y t t prime. This is the largest number of y, so that uh, induced subtrees of height at most y are identical in the two trees. In this example, 
all the induced subtrees of height at most three are identical. The parameter z is the smallest number z, so that there exists a vertex that is a root of the induced subtree of height z that the root has distinct parents in the two trees. So in this example, the vertex x11 uh, satisfies these conditions and this is the smallest, uh, the subtree of smallest height satisfying this condition. So it is, it gives value two for this parameter. There are a few more parameters with uh, the pairs of trees. They are a bit more technical. I'm not going to explain this. Uh, uh, then we have the parameters on graphs. So here is an example of a graph. The first parameter, uh, it's related to, to the worlds occurring in the graph. This graph contains two worlds, these two shaded uh, subgraphs. We have a three world and a four world. And this uh, parameter mg, it is the least common multiple of the numbers m such that uh, the graph contains an m world. So we have a three world and a four world, the least common multiple of uh, three and four is 12. The next parameter PG is the length of the longest uh, pleasant path. In this graph, the longest pleasant path is the path right here in the left. It has length nine. The next parameter EG, uh, it's the length of the longest entryway. An entryway is a pleasant path leading to a non-trivial strongly connected component. That is, it, it's, it's a path that is pleasant except for the last vertex. Here is the longest entryway. It has length four. Analogously, we have also outlets. That is a pleasant paths leading out from a, a non-trivial strongly connected components. So here is the longest outlet, it has length three. And we have a few more parameters that are a bit more technical. I'm, I'm not going to explain this, but with uh, the help of these numerical parameters, we can express the necessary and sufficient condition for an arbitrary directed graph G to satisfy an arbitrary directing identity, T equals T prime where the two uh, terms are distinct. So G satisfies this identity, T equals T prime, if and only if these conditions hold. So we have this, every non-trivial strongly connected component of G is a world. There is no path from a non-trivial strongly connected component to another. And then we have a few uh, relationships between uh, these numerical parameters. So we have a few inequalities uh, and one divisibility relation and that's it this is uh, yeah quite a nice result but unfortunately this doesn't give us directly information about the associative spectrum of g so we 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 don't have a good description of or a classification of the associative spectra for arbitrary directed graphs However, we obtained uh, by applying this uh, result uh, some bounds on the possible spectra of uh, directed graphs. And uh, there are basically three uh, different cases. Either the associative spectrum is the constant one sequence, that is the graph is associative, or the spectrum is a constant two sequence, and this holds if and only if each weakly connected component of G is either associative or a directed bipartite graph with at least one edge. And at least one of the components is this directed bipartite graph. In all other cases, the associative spectrum grows 
exponentially. More precisely, the spectrum is bounded below by the spectrum of this particular graph, whose spectrum is uh, grows exponentially with base 1.755 approximately. So this is quite a remarkable result, uh, and it is in stark contrast uh, with the, the, the possible spectra of uh, groupoids in general. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Waldhauser and his co-authors showed that there exist uh, groupoids with other growth rates. Uh, we have growth rates, uh, we, we have a spectra that are other constants than one or two, and we also have a spectra uh, that have sub-exponential growth rate, such as polynomials of arbitrary degrees. But with graph algebra, this doesn't happen. So this was basically all I wanted to tell you today. I will conclude this talk with uh, um, references to the literature on which this talk was based. Uh, I wrote two papers with uh, Tamas Waldhauser on this topic. They are both available on the archive. Uh, the first is going to appear soon on the, in the Journal of Algebraic Combinatorics. We have just uh, returned uh, our corrections to the page proofs, so we hope it's going to appear soon. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop the recording and we'll take questions. Thank you.